gentlemen. It's no secret that sponsorship is the lifeblood of sports. Sometimes, sponsorship money comes from very shady, not-so-clean places, but as long as it pays out, all is fine in the eyes of a team owner. One of these sources of money is tobacco companies. In Formula One, these tobacco companies were once so powerful that they influenced the paths of whole careers and teams. And due to the nature of how these companies got their money, there were many attempts to take these sponsorships away. Here are a few stories about how they passed by those attempts. We cannot talk about how Formula One circumvented attempts to get rid of tobacco sponsorships without first talking about how they became a thing in the first place. For that, we must go back to January of 1968, where the non-championship Tasman series was holding its third round of eight at Wigram Airfield. As was the style of the time, cars showed up in their national racing colors. Chris Amon's Ferrari was the usual Russell Corsa red, Jack Brabham showed up in green and yellow for Australia, the McLarens showed up in orange, and all the British privateers showed up in British racing green. But in a contrast from the norm, the Lotus boys had foregone their usual green for a red, white, and gold livery. Now why is that? Well, Colin Chapman, clever as he is, had himself an idea. It would be wrong to say that money was tight, but it surely wasn't getting any cheaper to run a race team. So, he struck himself a sponsorship deal with the Imperial Tobacco Company to run the logos of their Gold Leaf brand on his cars. This deal was worth about £100,000 in that time, so it paid for their whole budget and allowed the prize money to go into the pockets of their drivers, Graham Hill and Jim Clark. This was originally met with a plea to leave by the track officials, but Chapman convinced them that there would be people asking for refunds if Jimmy didn't race, so they relented. The new red and gold cars hit the track, and Jimmy won the race. And then went on to win the whole series, snubbing Chris Amon, like always. Two months later, Lotus would go to Brands Hatch for the non-championship race of champions, I know, where they would again be accosted for their corporate liveries. This time by ITV, Britain's only commercially operated TV channel at the time, and the channel that was given the rights to broadcast the race. ITV argued that they were being cheated out of the advertising money by Imperial, and Chapman was advertising for free. They didn't want to show the race if they weren't being paid by Imperial or Chapman to show these Gold Leaf logos. There was also the problem of tobacco advertising being banned on television in Britain since 1965 under the Television Act. This time, Chapman took the high road as he had no other choice, and his mechanics put spike tape over the logos. Graham Hill would retire after 11 laps with a drive shaft failure. Despite these few hiccups, the events of Wiggerman and Brands Hatch cracked the worldview wide open for sponsorship in Formula One. The FIA would give this way of funding its seal of approval at the season opening South African Grand Prix in 1968, giving Chapman their written consent to run these liveries pre race. In 1970, BRM would strike a £50,000 deal with British American Tobacco to advertise their perfume brand Yardley. The national racing colors were slowly phased out in favor of whatever color scheme the sponsors wanted, a practice that still continues to this day. While Graham Hill, Jackie Stewart, Pierce Courage, and Jack Brabham were the first drivers to drive with these new sources of money, Nicky Lauda was really the first to reap the benefits of the amount of money a race car driver could get at this time. A generous paycheck from Ferrari combined with sponsorships from companies like Marlboro made him a very, very rich man. Speaking of Marlboro, they were arguably the most powerful tobacco company in motorsport in their time. They were pretty much everywhere from the 70s all the way into 2017, being the title sponsors first for BRM in the early 70s and then moving on to McLaren and Ferrari, while also personally backing drivers like Ayrton Senna, Eddie Irvine, Rubens Barrichello, and Mika Hakkinen. The 1980s were the heyday of tobacco sponsorship, and opposition to it slowly mounted as the 90s rolled around. Alongside the ban in Britain, France banned tobacco advertisement in 1991 under Les Lois Evon, a subject that I talked about at length in these two videos that I made back in March. Wahey! Continuity! As the European Union got tougher on cigarette ads, teams started being clever about it. The main way of doing it being assaulting your mind with subliminal messages. <laughs> Sorry. 
you had to see that. The censored versions of these liveries eventually became iconic in their own right. Who could forget the Marlboro barcodes, the Rothmans question marks, and racing, Team Spirit, Buzz and Hornets, and Be on Edge, Mika and David. The video games of the time had to use these sanitized paint schemes or else the game would be restricted to rated T for Teen, or Peggy 16 over in the PAL regions, which would be a bad look for the sport. Somehow. Another small problem was Britain's laws against product placement on television. In 1954, the UK had passed a law that banned on-air product placement to keep advertising confined to ad breaks and curb any preferential treatment towards a certain brand, a law that would not be lifted until 2011. Getting around this was particularly tricky in the era when F1 was being broadcast on the BBC, the only channel where there are no ad breaks at all. Since the money used to run the BBC came out of people's taxes, they could afford to run the channel commercial free. It goes from the end of program number one, to a link, to the beginning of program number two. Man, I wish PBS worked like this. But anyhow, back on topic. The BBC's impartiality rules made it illegal to refer to anything by a brand name. With this in mind, the fact that they broadcasted F1 feels like a conflict of interest, although you could argue that everyone being present is impartiality in itself. At least that's how I look at it. Now, from an American perspective, all of these hoops that F1 had to jump through feels very weird, considering that our product placement and sponsorship is everywhere in our sports broadcasting, with our advanced auto parts race off pit road and our one lap to go sponsored by Credit One Bank. This is entirely normal here. To me, banning product placement on TV, especially in a sports context, feels like more trouble than it's worth. By 1997, virtually everyone had some interaction with the tobacco company. Benetton had title sponsorship from Mild 7. Ferrari had Marlboro. McLaren had West. Jordan had Benson and Hedges. Prost had Goulois. Pay drivers such as Ricardo Rossett, Luca Badoer, and Ukio Katayama had some backing from tobacco companies. Now, I know that these cigarette makers make their money through addiction and death, and smoking is terrible not only for the human body, but for the environment as well. But from a racing perspective, these endless sources of cash ironically kept the grid healthy. There was no way that Eddie Jordan could have afforded to hire Damon Hill had it not been for Benson and Hedges cutting him a blank check. The teams wanted the fastest guys they could get their hands on to drive their cars, and the tobacco companies just wanted to see their logos at the front of the pack. This money allowed the underdogs to have their day. But of course, a healthy product matters not to the government. The most interesting dodge of the law of the land took place in 1997, when Tony Blair took power in Britain. There had previously been a lobby to ban tobacco advertising on TV for many sports in Britain, F1 included, under the previous administration led by John Major and the Conservative Party, which continued into the Labour-led Blair administration. So Bernie Eccleston struck an air quotes deal with Tony and the Labour Party to keep F1 on the air. In the public eye, it was a £1 million donation to the party that was refunded, but behind the scenes, Bernie had pointed out two double standards in the law, snooker and football. Now, for fellow Yanks that aren't very familiar with snooker, the best way I could describe it is pool, but more complicated. The table is larger, there are more balls, and it's a lot like make it, take it, pick up basketball in the way that you could score all the points yourself without your opponent ever taking a shot. It's incredibly popular in Britain, and much like darts, from an outsider perspective, it's the hypest shit ever. <laughs> but anyhow, at that time, the World Snooker Tour and its big events were being broadcast on the BBC, and those big events, such as the World Championships and the Masters, had title sponsorship from Smokes, and were referred to on air as the Embassy World Snooker Championships and the Benson and Hedges Masters. In football, the Premier League was sponsored by Carling, the lager company, so there was alcohol advertisement, at prime time, on the BBC. It would even be referred to as the F.A. Carling Premiership on the broadcast, as well as on BBC Grandstand and Final Score when the late great Tim Goodgen would read out the classified results. At the end of the day, F1 stayed on TV, and it stays on TV in Britain to this day.
But of course, it couldn't stay this good forever. Australia shut their loopholes in their anti-smoking laws, and the rest of the EU countries that hosted races passed laws individually to ban smoke ads by the turn of the millennium. Williams was the first team to see this crackdown coming, ending their long-term sponsorship deal with Rothmans and going for a cleaner image, with sponsorships from Hewlett Packard, Compaq, and even Nicotin Nicotine Patches, which are designed to get you off of smoking. Foot the footprint of tobacco companies slowly faded away, taking many teams like Jordan with it, and by 2005, the European Union had banned tobacco advertising group-wide. The only races that allowed Ferrari, the only teams still clinging to sponsorship from Marlboro to keep running that logo on the car, were China, Bahrain, and Monaco. Their last attempt at covert advertising was putting the logos of their Mission Winnow... thing on their cars back in 2018 and 2019. I still have no idea what that entity even does. The tobacco money pit has since been closed, but in recent times, the role has been taken up by two other questionable practices with infinite sources of revenue. Vaping and gambling. McLaren opened the vaping can of worms by accepting sponsorship from the vape company Views, which is owned by Reynolds American, a subsidiary of British American Tobacco. It's not title sponsorship, but they're still very involved with the team, with their logos being pasted onto the side pods and the team's livery being designed by select artists once a year through their Driven by Change campaign. This past season, after the lapse of the Alfa Romeo partnership, Sauber accepted title sponsorship from the borderline omnipresent gambling company Stake, and their live leak replacement, I mean streaming service, Kick. It's an ongoing thing, so who knows how it will play out, but maybe vaping and gambling sponsorships will keep the grid healthy just like tobacco did all those years ago. And so that is how F1 repeatedly dodged anti-smoking laws worldwide to keep their teams afloat. It took a lot of loophole hunting and backdoor dealing, but it persevered through decades, giving us some pretty slick liveries in its time. Alright, that's it from me. I have been Bobcat205, thank you for watching, and remember, winners don't smoke. <laughs> I can't say that with a straight face.